Well, thank you. And let me just, uh, let me just give a little bit of my background uh, in a different way. I'm an obstetrician. I've delivered about 2,000 babies and um, I'd still be delivering babies in Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, if it wasn't for the fact that I happened to be a Penn State lecturer. Now, all of you are probably younger than I am, but back in 1982, 97% of OBGYNs were male. Anybody want to guess what the number one performed procedure in this country was? Hysterectomy and C-section, one and two. Males performing on females. So I happened to be listening to this very, very old professor. That's how I remember. He's probably my age now that I think about it. But um, he was talking about hysterectomy. He said, you know, it's no big deal. If you see a little fibroid, just take out the uterus. And all the students were writing that down. I happened to be at Barnes & Noble that night. And four of the top 10 nonfiction bestsellers were What My Hysterectomy Did to Me, The Hysterectomy Hoax, and How a Hysterectomy Ruined My Life. So the first time in my life that I realized that what we're teaching is really based on the past, not based on the future. I then went out uh, and actually out to Houston and, and did some of the work on how we avoid hysterectomy and got a couple patents. And it was the second aha moment in my life, which was, boy, individuals can actually make some changes. And then finally, I went in the 90s to Wharton and uh, I got a million and a half dollar grant to look at what makes physicians different than, depending on the audience, either other people or normal people in how we handle change. And that's a little bit of what I'd like to talk to you about. But, and a lot of it's gonna be based on the future, but I wanna start in the past. The first time I ever gave a talk in Texas, I was a senior medical student in 1978. And I remember, because the first time I had ever given a talk, and uh, I'd just seen the Rolling Stones, they were my favorite band. And what I talked about as a student, they wanted to know how a student viewed the future. And they said, I said, boy, do you think we can get physicians to embrace change? And it would be nice if we could create high-powered teams in healthcare. And God, my bank just got an ATM. Why can't healthcare do cool things like that? Um, and I remember that I was very nervous the night before and saw this movie that nobody thought would make it uh, about uh, the rebel alliance science fiction. So here we are in 2018. Um, the Rolling Stones are still around. They look a little bit different. And if I was talking to you as the, as the president of a health science university or as a CEO of a 14 hospital system, I'd say, gosh, we really have to figure out how we can get physicians to embrace change. We really have to figure out how we can get high powered teams in healthcare. And how come I can do all my shopping in my pajamas while I'm watching Game of Thrones, but if I have a stomach ache, I still have to get on the phone, listen to 11 options to get an appointment on Wednesday. And just as I was thinking, wow, that's, um, 22, that's 40 years and nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. On my uh, IMDb, uh, I found that the number one grossing film of last year was this. So I said, wow, nothing has changed in 40 years. Now, one thing has clearly changed. Uh, this was me in 1978. And um, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the things about getting old, I don't really miss the hair, but I really miss the car. It's a 1968 GTO 400 four barrel. So, um, what I'm gonna ask you to do is, is, this is South by Southwest, so I wanna think about the future. So I'm gonna ask you to play along with me a little bit and really get to 2028. I'm gonna help you. Um, it's, by the way, the Rolling Stones are still around in 2028. They're on the zombie tour. They're doing pretty well in the Walking Dead tour. Um, but it's March 5th, 2028. Let's all, let's all pretend we're looking back on 2018. So I'll give you a few things that are happening. Um, President Chelsea Clinton is debating not Republican nominee Ivanka Trump in a tight race, so nothing's changed there. Harrison Ford has signed on for one last uh, sequel, The Legend of Bingo Night. But more importantly, medical education has evolved to the point where we're creating physicians of the future that view themselves as members of a high-powered team along with their other human and robot professionals. So how did we get there? Well, back in 2018, we were counting on the government to help solve this problem. This says healthcare reform has confused everybody. Actually, I'm not the doctor, I'm the healthcare administrator. That's okay, I'm not the patient, I'm his attorney. We are all confused in running healthcare, waiting for the government to fix it. So it's very hard to do a non political statement about healthcare in 2018, but I'm gonna try. The Affordable Care Act back in 2018 did exactly the job we asked it to do, gave a lot more people access to a fundamentally broken, fragmented, expensive, inequitable, and occasionally unsafe healthcare delivery system, and then hope that we would transform. So my criticism is just that when, when President Obama and Speaker Pelosi and Barney Frank were there saying, we did what 15 administrations couldn't do, they, they passed the bill, but they didn't force us or the force you as patients to transform. 
And the reason I have President George W. Bush here, it's not dissimilar to after 48 hours of the war in Iraq saying mission accomplished and somebody saying, wait, there might be another 30 or 40 years of nation building. So here's the story. If, 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 if you really want to think about what's wrong, there's a book by Bill Kissick that was written about 40 years ago from Wharton. It talks about the iron triangle of access, quality, and cost. If you increase one angle, you got to decrease another. 40 years ago, he said, if anybody ever tells you they're going to increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost without disrupting the system, and disruption is painful, they're not telling the truth. So think about it. President Obama and the Democrats said, we're going to increase access, increase quality, and decrease costs, and it's not going to be painful. Quote, President Trump said, it's going to be beautiful, terrific, unbelievable, and huge, but what he really meant is we're going to increase access, increase quality, decrease cost, and it's not going to be painful. So really, the problem is that we, and you as patients, haven't disrupted the system. And I'm not going to go through all of this other than to say uh, we need a 9-11 approach to the healthcare crisis. And part of that 9-11 approach, and when I say 9-11, if you think back to what happened then, the Democrats first blamed the Republicans, the Republicans blamed the Democrats, but then the, the Congress said we failed to keep the country safe and they created the 9-11 Commission. What we've talked about is we need the same kind of approach. The Affordable Care Act was a great start, but it didn't get us to where we want. The Republicans really haven't shown that they have a clue as far as what to do. So literally, we need the same kind of 9-11 approach. Here's the good news. The, 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 th the two things that are going to ca cause the greatest change are, are the two things in the, um, in the bottom there. High deductible plans are, are causing the patient to become the decider. I'm going to give you a real live example. My daughter is 29. She's a millennial, I guess, and um, she calls me up. She's a public health professional down at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, right on the university's campus. And she has the kind of insurance plan that I believe that every middle class person will have, about $300 a month and a $4,000 deductible. She called me up. She said, Dad, what do you think about, and it was a small community hospital outside of Tampa. And I said, well, why, Len? You're right on the university hospital campus. Well, don't worry, Dad. I need, a, I need a, a small procedure. It'll be $200 of my money if I get it done at that hospital, and $800 of my money if I get it at the university hospital that you ran. That's $600. That's a weekend in Miami, dude. Oh, I said, I know that, uh, dude. But um, um, I just said, one more thing. I went on healthgrades.com, same grade. I went on leapfrog.com, they got the same amount of errors. Oh, one more thing, Dad. I went on patientslikeme.com. Do you know that the waiting rooms are cleaner and the staff is friendlier at that hospital than the hospital you ran? So that's the change. When you start to, as patients, start to look at us differently. Doctors are not ready for that. And probably the, the biggest one is what was announced, with not that much fanfare, of Amazon, uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan forcing healthcare to enter the co consumer revolution. They said, basically, for those of you who remember the movie Network, uh, where the guy said, we're mad as hell, we're not going to take it anymore. That was their moment. We've given up on you, healthcare system, solving the problem. We're tired of the doctors blaming the insurers, the insurers blaming pharma, everybody blaming the lawyers. So we need you to change. So, so the simple fact is this, that um, whether or not we transform is no longer a question. And the fact is that those folks that made that decision, that at Amazon and Berkshire and J.P. Morgan knew all these facts. In fact, one of the people I talked to from Amazon is, we view you like Macy's, Sears, and Pennies. You've got every chance to change, and you've decided you're just going to keep doing the same old thing. And look at what we did to Macy's, Sears, and Pennies. So when you look at all these things, every single one of these things, and I had a chance to work with Apple in the year 2000. And if you think back uh, then, um, the differentiating factor at Apple was the fact that they were able to think about what's going to be obvious 10 years from now and, not, and start to do it today. They recognized that that industry was going from computer industries to digital health lifestyle. We're going from hospital companies to consumer health entities. And if you thought about the folks that literally were just thinking as computer companies like Gateway or even Dell, well, we'll just make better and smaller laptops while Steve Jobs was making iPods in the iTunes store, that's exactly what's going to happen in healthcare. So my passion as a medical educator and as somebody who's done a lot of research on physicians is what are the education things that need to happen when the patient becomes the boss? I'm sure you've all been here. It says we're running a little behind, so I'd like each of you to ask yourself, am I really that sick or would I just be wasting the doctor's valuable time? 
the healthcare system has been run on what's good for the doctor. And here's what's coming, coming really to a theater near us, and that the transparency revolution will start this revolution. I'll give you two examples. Any of you ever use Metacritic for movies? So Metacritic, it does a meta-analysis of all the, all, what all the reviews are on a movie, and you can put in your preferences, and it'll give you a score based on, based on your preferences and based on all the, those things. And then you can keep getting further and further down. Well, I'd like to see what the Philadelphia Inquirer says, or I'd like to see what the Washington Post says. And, and you can choose your movie based on that. They're doing a Metacritic health now for the same kind of thing. Huge change. I'm on the... Um, I'm on the board of a company that's doing Match.com for obstetricians and obstetric patients. Let's think about it. The average obstetric patient is pretty young, 20s, early 30s. There's nothing that they do where they don't check on the internet. The, the chances that the old days of what I was used to, they have a 65-year-old primary care doctor who says, congratulations, Mrs. Jones, you're pregnant. I'm sending you to my obstetrician, of them saying, oh, great, is zero. Because I said, well, that might be who you'd go to. Uh, but let me tell you, uh, I want somebody that's going to accept my doula, predominantly uh, female. Uh, I, I can only be seen on Fridays because that's the only day I can get off. So we basically created a Match.com. Um, I met my wife on Match.com. She uh, went to a Catholic university. It was a very detailed, very accurate uh, profile. Uh, mine was... Um, well, in today's uh, society, probably as close to accurate as anything else we see uh, on the net. But the fact is that literally they were able to look and say, where does that match? So here's what it'll be. It'll be, I need somebody that will accept my door, that can see me on Fridays, that I have a Aetna uh, gold plan. I don't want to pay more than $1,000 deductible. I live in Bryn Mawr. Oh, by the way, I'd like you to open up your data to me so I can see what your leapfrog scores are, what other patients say about you, uh, and I will choose you. Here's what's interesting. About 70% of the docs say, I'll be danged if I'm ever going to, that's not what I went to medical school. 30% of the physicians say, this is great. I'll do great in that. Um, and again, uh, if you believe that things are going to be the way they were, you know which ones are going to win. So, so just a little bit of what we've done at Jefferson, because we've really started a whole new model. And we said, we are, we are, we're 194 years old. We were the third medical school in the country. The first one that thought it would be a good idea if you saw humans. Before us, you would just do your research and academics and then practice on humans. So we actually started to think about what things are obvious in every other part of your life that don't happen in medicine. One of them was um, rounds. If you, have a, if you have a mom or dad in an in a NCI cancer center, National Cancer Institute Cancer Center, there's 60 in the country. You are still, in 2018, calling your mom and saying, Mom, what's going on? I don't know. The doctor came in around 5.30 in the morning, hardly talked to me. There were six young people that looked like they just got out of high school. I think they were the residents, but I'm confused. Put me over to the nurse's station. Ding, ding, ding. Doctor's in the OR all day. So we said, let's do virtual rounds. So when somebody comes into our cancer center, we basically say, who would you like to communicate with? I have a daughter in Denver, a son in Miami. We send them software. We partner with a company called Blue Jean Software. And we text them when we're making rounds. Now, I had a chance to be an undercover boss. The day before Father's Day last year, I had emergency lung surgery at Jefferson. I had three children coming to visit me for Father's Day, one from Alaska, one from Tampa, and one down from New York. And all they knew was that dad was having emergency surgery. I had signed up for virtual rounds. And this is not simulated. This is real. This is five minutes uh, into the recovery room with my three children on three different uh, iPads with my surgeon, Dr. Nate Evans, saying, um, he's going to be OK. You can come down this weekend. Now, all three of them said that I offered them a car, which is why we don't do this five minutes after anesthesia anymore. But the fact is that that, that patient satisfaction is fundamentally different. We started to look at artificial intelligence. The only conflict of interest thing that I'd give you is that I'm on IBM Watson Health. Uh, advisory board, but we actually worked with Amazon where things get messed up in healthcare most is in transfers. There's about, we had 20 humans dealing with transfers coming from another hospital with a stroke or whatever. We have about 500 ambulances <coughs> and several helicopters. That, that's now gotten down to two or three humans with Alexa, and this was a pilot we did with Alexa, and this is what it looks like. Alexa, I have a Jefferson transfer. Okay, 
Will the patient need a transfer to neurology or trauma? For trauma, please. Okay, I am currently contacting the Jeff Stat team. Hi, Dr. Barber, this is Kim from the Transfer Center. Yes, we would like to speak to Dr. Plasco in reference to transferring a patient. Yes. No problem. Hold on, please. All right, Dr. Plasco, so you're in Kelly Bad? All right, any specific units? Now that didn't just happen. Uh, we have 39. Alexa, I have a Jefferson transfer. Okay, I am currently contacting the Jeff Stat team. We will give you a call within the next couple of minutes with transport options and a doctor from the trauma department on the line. Please have the patient's information ready. Thank you. So we hired 39 folks. Uh, average age is about 25. Um, to run this thing called digital innovation and consumer experience. Instead of fighting that, literally within Jefferson, those folks are helping us. And we've also found this. Now, while you might not want to get this in the middle of a date or in the middle of a talk, the simple fact is by doing a one-click piece on your iPhone or your Apple Watch, we've been able to increase preventive visits by about 70%. Believe it or not, in 2018, for things like colonoscopies or lab tests, most people are still getting an email or even a mailed letter saying it's time for your X. And you put it in a pile. Uh, the difference between times is saying it's time for your X book here and having a schedule there, which is how the rest of your world lives, creates a much different environment. So here's the 10-year game changer if you look back from 2018. By 2020, 25% of hospitals with a billion dollars in net revenue were providing real-time genomic-based decision support at the time of writing prescriptions. By 2022, 20% 20 of the population with chronic diseases were relying on virtual health assistance and AI for wellness and management. By 2025, 35% of all care in the US was delivered virtually. And just last year, for the first time, the majority of interactions were virtual or remote, and the majority of those involved AI, deep learning, and machine cognition. That is not science fiction. That is absolute. And in fact, I was on a panel with John Scully, who had been the former CEO of Apple, and he said, stop talking about telehealth. He said, we don't talk about telebanking. We don't get up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to telebank today. It's just that we went from 90% of the interactions about your money being in a bank, by the way, most of which closed at 5 o'clock other than on Fridays, to 90% of the time being 24-7 at your house and almost nothing you have to do in the bank. So this is not science fiction. This is literally the future that we're looking at. Um, it doesn't mean you'll be able to list your iPhone as your primary care physician. And that's what I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking about because we need humans but we need a very, very different kind of selection education mechanism for the humans that are doctors, nurses, pharmacists, et cetera. And uh, the first thing I talk, start you with is uh, uh, two quotes. One is uh, from Dr. Monor said, technology will replace 80% of what doctors do. That gets a lot of my colleagues really angry. But the next quote is probably more important, which is from Dr. Kozla, says any doctor that can be replaced by a computer probably should be. So if you just take those two things and you think about the revolution that needs to happen. Now here's the part that's amazing. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, I mentioned that I got a million and a half dollar grant to look at what makes different uh, doctors different than normal people. And, and here's what we found, that the way we select and educate physicians, we've joined a cult. And that cult is around four biases, a competitive bias, an autonomy bias, a hierarchical bias, or a big pecking order, please, professor, associate professor, assistant professor, and a non-creativity bias. Now, I want to put an asterisk around the non-creativity bias because I've done a lot of writing about that. We're just as creative as you are. But when we ask entrepreneurs, when we ask business people, when we ask just about anybody that's successful, give me the top three things that got you to where you are. Creativity is number one, two, or three in about 90% of the cases. When we ask physicians, especially academic physicians, give me the top three things that got you where you are. It's focus, it's discipline, it's, it's, it's those scientific rigidity things. So if you just think about that, <clears throat> if you believe you're creative and the world around you is changing, 
you're really excited about that. I'm going to win in that environment. If you believe you're an autonomous, hierarchical, competitive creature and the world is changing, you're afraid of that. So just about the main reason we haven't transformed is because the people that run the system that needs to transform are afraid of any change for all the right reasons. So part of what we looked at is, is we asked physicians uh, practicing three years or, 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 or less, how did we do? How did we do around the country in teaching you? This is what they said. You did a really lousy job. I have about $300,000 worth of debt. And you taught me a lot of biochemistry and a lot of microbiology and a lot of anatomy and a lot of gastrointestinal, et cetera. But I'm a family doc, and um, I don't really use the biochemistry and the microbiology. I didn't need to learn how to manage change. You didn't teach me that. I need to learn a lot about negotiations, healthcare financing. Oh, by the way, I'm in a city which has huge health inequities and disparities. Nobody really ever even talked to me about that. Um, I'm in a 50-person group. Nobody talked to me how to be an individual in an organization, or, or I think quality matters, right? So um, nobody really talked about understanding quality metrics. The surgeons that I hung out with just said they're the best, or running an effective meeting, or gosh, you know, um, we're getting killed by this competitive practice that's doing a lot of digital marketing and going after consumers. Boy, nobody really talked to me about that either. So, so as one person said, great, thanks. Um, you charged me about uh, $300,000 and taught me exactly half of what I need to know. So um, you're all too young for this, but if you just think about how people perceive us, in the 60s there was a show called Marcus Welby. That's how the 20-some-year-old folks that were writing about doctors perceived us. Marcus was a family doc who would go in the morning to the homeless shelter, take care of, of people for free. On the way home to lunch, a cow would be having trouble delivering a calf, he'd deliver it. He'd then go to his family practice office in the afternoon and do left ventricular neurosurgery at night. We were empathetic gods that could do anything. We now have Gray's Anatomy in house, so you think we were narcissistic. Uh, so just to sort of put that in perspective, here's what we've gone from. That's your bag, not mine, all that adequate staff and equipment and financing. That's the scene with the big waiting room and a lot of nurses, and, and everybody has to wait at least for a half an hour until the doctor can see you. And then they usher you into a, a, a cubbyhole examining room, and when the door finally opens and the doctor comes in, it's not your doctor, no, it's Dr. So-and-so, who tells you that he's gone over your file very carefully and knows as much about you as your doctor. And Wednesdays, oh no, doctor is off on Wednesday, so don't get sick then. And house calls, well, forget that. Yeah, that's your scene, not mine. I'll admit that what you've just described is partly true. But don't make the doctor the heavy. Hello, sick people and their loved ones. In the interest of saving time and avoiding a lot of boring chit-chat later, I'm Dr. Gregory House. You can call me Greg. I'm one of three doctors staffing this clinic this morning. Short, sweet, grab a file. This ray of sunshine is Dr. Lisa Cuddy. Dr. Cuddy runs this whole hospital, so unfortunately she's much too busy to deal with you. I am a board certified diagnostician with a double specialty of infectious disease and nephrology. I'm also the only doctor currently employed at this clinic who's forced to be here against his will. That is true, isn't it? But not to worry, because for most of you, this job could be done by a monkey with a bottle of Motrin. So, so how did we have patients' perception, young people's perception, writing a medical shows think we went from Marcus Welby to House. Well, it's actually pretty simple. Believe it or not, doctors in 2018, today, are still primarily chosen based on science GPA, MedCats, and organic chemistry performance. And somehow, we're just amazed that physicians aren't more empathetic, communicative, and creative. And then we put them through uh, a surgical residency uh, that looks something like this, so does anyone else feel that their needs aren't being met? Um, so just to give you this example, when I went to Wharton at the MBA, every, everything in medicine is look to the left of you, look to the right of you, one of you will get in. And then when you finally get in, it's look to the left of you, look to the right of you, one of you will get the best residency. And then we're somehow amazed that doctors and nurses don't work as high-powered teams. When I was at Wharton, the very first day, they said the most important decision you will make your entire two years here is your study group, because every grade you get will be a study group grade. And they threw the hundred of us in a room, so they get somebody from finance, somebody from accounting, somebody from management, somebody from marketing. 
you know, frankly, it was pretty depressing for me because people said, what are you? I said, I'm a gynecologist and nobody wanted me in their study group. It was left in the center of the room. It was a little bit like gym class in the 70s. But once I got through that, I learned to be, I learned to be interdependent. So, so what does the doctor of the future look like? Believe it or not, and I, I just really want you to internalize this, if any of you have uh, brothers, sisters, cousins, or you, any of you are physicians, um, the gateway to being a physician is organic chemistry. You get a C or C minus in organic chemistry, you are never going to be a doctor. It's like the combine for the NFL. You do a 4 9 40, you're over. Organic chemistry hasn't changed that much since I had all that hair. It's basically taking something like this and then erasing all the C's and O's and say, fill that in. Now that's exactly who you want for your psychiatrist or your family doctor, right? And think about how asinine that is today when, when, the, uh, when all of this is on your or iPhone. Now there was a reason for this, by the way. Back in the 70s, if I could memorize 19 reasons somebody had jaundice or a headache, then I was a better doctor than somebody who could memorize 15. But now the 19 are on my supersized iPhone, and half the students that we admit can't communicate very well, can't see different shades of yellow. So we started a medical school that was totally based on choosing students based on self-awareness and empathy. And um, here's how it went. Interestingly, we partnered with two non-medical companies on our admissions committee. One was Southwest Airlines. Why? Because Southwest Airlines used to choose pilots the way we choose doctors. They would put the two pilots on a simulator and say, you were 97th percentile, you were 95th percentile, you're our pilot. Then they realized that the guys that landed in the Hudson were not because they were 0.02% better technically, it's because they could communicate and see the second and third order consequences of their decisions. They also recognized that after about 90%, technically it was all the same. So now what happens is they put the two on, and if they're over 90%, they have something happen in the cockpit. And they look for your first reaction in communication and your first reaction in communication. And the person with the clipboard is not, a, is not a metrics person, it's a behavioral therapist to really see how you reacted. The second one, which was interesting, was a company out of uh, University of Pennsylvania called Telios. Telios does all the interviewing for Google. Google does not want to see your transcripts. So my son uh, got interviewed and got a job at Google. Um, he didn't take it and became an actor. That's uh, over a cocktail party. But uh, at the end of the day, the way that they chose those folks, after a few behavioral clinical interviews, they would call David up on a Friday and say, David, where are you at? Um, I'm, at a, I'm at a bar in Brooklyn. Tell me about the people around you, just to see if he could communicate and, and, and understand uh, his surroundings. So, so we started this medical school where once you reach the minimums, we didn't know what school you went to, we didn't know what your science GPA was, we didn't know what your med were. We just knew that you'd reached the minimum uh, to, uh, to be able to understand scientifically. And then we did things like this. We would take them to this art museum and say, um, tell me what you see in, in this picture. So it goes something like this. And these are two different students. Hey, welcome. Hi, thank you very yeah. much. Hey, yeah, have you seen seat. my hand cat? Uh, it's okay, I brought one for you anyways. Thank you, we're just gonna talk. Okay. What do you think, um, my photograph here on the wall. I just have this. This one? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I see a guy in a black turtleneck, a girl in a white dress, and a snake. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. But what does it mean to you? How does how does how do you react to it? What does it mean to me? Uh, I don't know. I see a guy in a black turtleneck, a girl in a white dress. And a snake. Have you seen my MCATs? Have we talked about this? Now let me ask you a question. Have you seen my grades? Have you seen my references? I may need a cup of coffee. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Yeah, have a seat. Thanks, I appreciate that warm welcome. We're just gonna talk. Terrific. What do you think of my photograph that I have up here on the wall? Your photograph? Well, it's certainly striking. <laughs> I see I see a family portrait, but it's a really unusual one. Uh, in the center, there's the teenage daughter, but it's like she's raided her mother's closet. 
She went into the closet and she found this fancy dress. It's made of white lace. You know, it could be a bridal dress or a party dress. Um, but it doesn't really fit her. She's a little too young for it still. So she puts this fancy dress on. But then in contrast to that, she's holding a huge snake in the center of this family portrait. Now, I've never seen a family portrait like that before. To me, that snake is a symbol of her rebellion. You know, she wanted to do something really unusual. She didn't want to participate in a boring old portrait. So you might say, Steve, why does that matter? Well, here's the story. Um, I've delivered, as I mentioned, 2,000 babies. And it's really easy delivering a 7 and a half pound baby to a normal 27-year-old. I mean, it's easy for me to say I'm on the other end, but it's, it's medically easy. It's incredibly difficult delivering an unscheduled Down syndrome baby. And 100% of the time, the first question the patient asks is, doctor, what does this mean? I've watched. Great doctors or good doctors like that first applicant start to talk about the 21st chromosome. No, but doctor, what does that mean? Well, your baby might get pulmonary fibrosis. I've watched great obstetricians, probably like that second applicant will be, understand that what does that mean is what does that mean to my image of a perfect baby? And right away, we'll talk about how beautiful the baby is, and we'll get you together with other people that have had beautiful babies like that. That 30-second answer is the difference between how that mom, in some cases that dad, imprints with that baby. And here's the rub. There's a 100% chance, since we're talking about the future, so I can talk back in the past, but by 2021, maybe even by 2020, there was an IBM Watson, a Google Brain, that's going to be able to take a picture of the baby. I don't care how good you were in organic chemistry, be much better at memorizing the 8,700 genetic things that could, that, that, that could be off, just by that picture of the baby, et cetera. He, she, or it will never, ever get the what does it mean means what does that mean to my perfect baby. So at the end of the day, we are training doctors right now to be better robots than robots that don't exist, which was fine when the robots didn't exist. When the robots exist, it really, really becomes a, a, a no-win scenario. So how can we select and fo foster humans and not robots? And, um, this is one of the best quotes. This is Jack Ma. And this has really, really helped me understand what we need to do in academic medicine to transform the, and change the DNA of, of healthcare one physician at a time. No matter how artificial intelligence is good, human being in the future competing with the machine on knowledge, you don't have a chance. Computer is always going to be smarter than you are. When there's a car, forget about it, who run faster. When there's a plane, don't think you can fly like a... When there's a computer, you know, computer is always smarter than you are. They never f forget. They remember everything. They never get angry. They calculate faster. But computer can never be as wise as a man. What's the difference between smart and wisdom? So my passion has been how do we start to select and educate wise physicians because you can't outrun a car, can't outfly a plane, and you're not going to be able to out organic chemistry or out memorize a computer. But you can double down on being human, which is increasingly important. So, so as we start to think about it, actually the whole, the whole world changes for our medical students and our doctors, because this is from Tom Friedman's book, but in the 21st century, knowing all the answers will not distinguish intelligence. It's the ability to ask the right questions and think on the fly. So just a couple things about that medical school that we started. It was called Select, um, and we selected and mentored the students for EQ and leadership. We had high maturity and diversity. And here's, here was probably the most interesting fact, that Select, which was based in Tampa, we really didn't have a very large, diverse population, became number seven in the country in diversity and attracting applicants, applications from black male applicants. The three there that I bring, Morris, Howard, and Xavier, uh, are actually historically black colleges and universities. By the way, this was not even trying to do that. It was just using holistic admissions. So if you want to think about a tale of two cities in this country, there are people in Philadelphia whose parents spend this is not an exaggeration, $120,000 to get little Johnny or little Deborah 
uh, uh, seven uh, Princeton reviews and five tutors to be able to memorize well enough to get a great grade on the MedCats. We have 12,000 applicants for 290 slots at Jefferson, so I've met some of these folks. Some of them are not even sure they want to be a, a physician, but they can memorize the MedCats. We have another student that might have a battered Barron's book that really wants to go back to his or her community and take care of that community as a family doc that literally is just going based on that battered Barron's book. What's fascinating is that if you start to choose students based on self-awareness, empathy, communication skills, the way that they choose pilots, your diversity triples. So just to put this in real live perspective, in 1978, the AAMC estimated that 4% of matriculating medical students were African American males. We doubled down on everything that didn't work, affirmative action type things that, that were inconsistent, just doing scholarships. Um, you want to guess what it was in 2016? 4%. You go and do this holistic criteria like Boston University has done, Holistic commissions brought the class from 11% to 20% without actually saying we're trying to get more African-American or Latino um, uh, students. We also did something, and, and I have to give my predecessors a lot of credit. 30 years ago, we started something called the Jefferson Scale of Patient Perceptions of Physician Empathy. It was, a, it was an instrument developed to measure patient perceptions of how our medical students, our docs, uh, and, and our faculty were doing. It was led by a guy named Dr. Hojat. And, and he's written all over the world, but that empathy is not an emotion. It's actually a cognitive skill that can be selected for and learned. And I, I just want to stop there for a second. Because if you believe that, and you believe that there's going to be a black box that's going to be better than memorizing the science, and you're trying to pick a, a family doc, a, a psychiatrist, an OBGYN, then you want to select for that skill, and you want to teach that skill. It can be learned, it can be measured, and it can be used to test new innovations in education. One of those new, uh, new uh, initiatives uh, has been something that we at Jefferson are, are leading the nation. It's called hotspotting. And what it is is basically getting our students across our nursing school, our medical school, our design school, because we just acquired a design university, to really, to really meet with patients with chronic diseases and create somebody for them to talk to. Now, here's what's interesting about it. So basically, you take these high-risk, high-cost patients with chronic and complex illnesses. For those of you who are in, um, in healthcare, 5% of the population consumes 50% of, of the resources. People come into our ER three times, three times a week. Medicaid pays for it. So remember I said we've got to get a dollar to a dollar and a quarter. You could solve it just by doing that. And you know, insurance companies have tried some things that haven't worked, and hospitals have tried some things that haven't worked. The students actually communicate with the patients, give them somebody to talk to. And, and one of the students, I met with them on Wednesday, said, um, and it's sort of students teaching teachers, but why don't the people running the healthcare system recognize that simple things can cut costs and improve care? So let me give you an example. She had, they had a patient that had a colostomy and a lot of other uh, uh, things. She just didn't understand how to change her colostomy back. She would come into the ER to do it because nobody ever talked to her and asked her why she was coming to the ER. So they change her colostomy bag, they do some blood tests, it caught, it, cost the government $5,000, literally three times a week. These folks, these students, basically talk to her about how to do it, text her every couple days, how are you doing, stop by her house. She hasn't been to the ER in three months. They saved the system hundreds of thousands of dollars. They learned how to work together as physicians and nurses, and they recognized uh, how, how much it means. So, so we've taken this full bore, and we now, as I mentioned, we acquired a design university. These are just some of the things that we do now that every one of our students does. We have an introduction to creative writing course. Um, 
the Art of Ob Observation at uh, the, the uh, Pennsylvania uh, uh, Fine Arts Museum is a lot like uh, that selection thing I talked to you about. The Empathy Project is really cool. Lantern Theater Company is a really good small uh, theater company, uh, literally right next door to Jefferson. And we had students actually take their most difficult patient experiences and work with writers and actors to do these little 10 minute vignettes about what happened. Some of them are funny, some of them are poignant, some of them are sad. Uh, one was about a mistake that the student made and how it affected folks. Um, so literally, um, what we're finding is what used to be considered the soft part of medical education is now the most sought after part of what we do at Jefferson. So what becomes the definition of intelligence really changes, and most of us aren't ready for that. It also changes what we teach. So this is not a lie. This is the average medical school in the United States in 2018. Lots of microbiology, lots of biochemistry, eh, a little bit of quality and safety, because that's not all that important. A little bit of, you know, we probably ought to change the way we, we patients experience the system. Oh, health disparities? Yeah, we can have a day on that. So, I mean, I gave this exact talk at a top 10 uh, medical college, academic uh, medical center, and the dean was very upset. He said, you know, I just want you to know, we have a whole day the third year on quality and safety. <laughs> a whole day for the number three cause of death in the United States, a whole day. So literally the whole concept of taking disparities, patient experience, and quality and safety longitudinally and making more of the microbiology and biochemistry into online type things that they can do uh, in a different way is different. So here's where we've moved to. Our four most successful new colleges are our College of Emerging Health Professions. What jobs are going to be needed 10 years from now in a transformed healthcare system that don't exist today? It goes everywhere from community ambassadors uh, to um, uh, to uh, genomics and um, uh, computer science. We have a degree in genomics and computer science. We have our communications future center. How do you communicate with patients? We have our college of digital health. And interestingly, and not surprisingly, probably our most, uh, uh, our most, it, most interest garnered in a new course has been in our master's in medical cannabis education and research, which also uh, had me go up a few uh, ticks in the presidential uh, popularity poll at Jefferson. So, so what we found, what we found is that we've been able actually to start to overcome the biases. So it's just like any other cult. If you believe the way we select and educate doctors, we've joined a cult. You have to deprogram that cult before you can reprogram it. So th through Jeff design and encouraging boldness and thinking differently and handling and embracing failure, which all of you as entrepreneurs know needs to happen, we have a faculty, as one of the accreditors said, boy, you know, you're the first place we've, we've looked at where your faculty is more optimistic about the future than the past. There's a reason for that, because if you believe you're creative again, you believe you'll be able to be part of it. And we also have created this interprofessional culture with folks working together. So I mentioned uh, Jeff Design. My office is in the first Federal Reserve Bank in Philadelphia. We have the largest vault in the country. This vault is a block long. This is Dr. Bon Ku, who leads Jeff Design. We moved Jeff Design from the medical school to this 190-year-old vault that used to keep all the gold bullion back when the United States actually had money to back up their currency. And this is Bon. Traditionally, we've been masters at memorization, having this knowledge that other uh, people don't have, that our patients don't have. But as, as we look forward and kind of like peak 20 years into the future, that uh, kind of superpower that we have and knowledge, that's, that's going to be shrinking with artificial intelligence and machine learning, and we really need to tap into a different skill set. And I believe that doctors are creative people, and that creativity is actually in a, one of the most important skill sets that a physician needs. And so we built the Health Design Lab, and I love it. It's, it's a space for us to really use our imaginations in thinking about how to solve challenges in healthcare. And, in medicine, we don't, we don't get that. So, and this is just an article um, uh, that we just wrote about uh, how we've done that our, compared to our control medical school colleagues, our students have high scores for wisdom, empathy, and tolerance of ambiguity. 
and much lower scores for burnout, physical fatigue, and emotional exhaustion. I want to hit one other part of, of, of medical education that's sort of a little weird. So um, I'm a pilot, and every two years, I have to get my technical competence assessed. I'm also a surgeon. Anybody want to guess the last time anybody checked my technical competence? 30 years ago. 30 years ago. So it's partly why we, we, we don't learn from our mistakes. Just like that guy, uh, we keep making the same mistakes uh, over and over again. So we actually started a simulation center where we basically said, we think the, the myth of see one, do one, teach one, which is if you ask any of your surgeons that are friends, is how I learned to do something. Really, again, just like medical education made sense in the 70s, doesn't make sense anymore. And these are just three facts that we need to overcome. Hospitals are helpless when it comes to physicians with frequent complications because we never check the technical competence, unlike pilots. We have no way of determining if someone is, who's trained in a new technology is competent. I don't know where you all come from, but you've probably seen billboards come to my hospital because we have a robot. They never really talk about the human behind the robot about whether or not that person is competent. And that whole see one, do one, teach one thing doesn't make sense if you're the one on the other end. So, you know, again, we worked with the aviation industry, and this was a, actually a true letter that, they, that, that an eight-year-old wrote because they just assumed that the pilot would get them down safely. It says, Dear Captain, my name is Nicola. I'm eight years old. This is my first flight, but I'm not scared. I like to watch the clouds go by. My mom says the crew is nice. I think your plane is good. Thanks for a nice flight. Don't mm, up the landing. Love, Nicola. So uh, while her mom might not have been thrilled that the only word she spelled right was the one I crossed out, even she got it. This is what happens now. I learned how to intubate a one and a half pound baby in the middle of a chaotic delivery room with uh, the dad over me, with a real baby. And I won't go through all the technical details, but it's a very, very, very difficult technical procedure. We don't let any of our medical students do that now until they prove that they can do it on this, this, uh, this silicon baby. And if you ever came to our simulation center, you'd see that some of these silicon babies have some pretty big gashes that we can fix if it's a silicon baby. And again, I think we're going to get to the point where, uh, where this, is, uh, this is what we have to prove. So every podcast comes with a, a commercial at some point. So this is going to be my 30-second commercial at Jefferson, because there's a statute in Philadelphia that if you don't mention the Eagles winning the Super Bowl at least once, you're not allowed to be in Philadelphia. Uh, so we actually had a Super Bowl ad, because we're, uh, we're the docs for the Eagles. Uh, and I'm sorry if I've deflated the morale of any of the New England fans here, but um, So that's all you need to know about Jefferson in 30 seconds. I want, I want, to, I want to finalize this and, and just a few minutes on the fact that we can train new, new medical students, we can assess competence, but what about the docs that are already out there in the faculty? And, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we started something called JOLT, Jefferson Onboarding Leadership Transformation. And the first thing was recognizing who we had to teach. This is a study we did where 20% of the doctors get it, 15% of the doctors will never get it, and then there's 65% in the middle. What we found is that CEOs like myself spend 40% of the time with the docs that get it because we feel comfortable with them. They like us, we like them, we play golf with them. We spend 45% of our time with docs, we'll never get it because they're loud and we can cure anybody. And the least amount of time with the people in the middle, they'll change the culture. So what we did at Jefferson is we turned the 20% into mentors and spend less time with them but give them opportunities to expand. We spend no time with the people that will never get it. We call it administrative hospice. 
We just let them uh, go off and, and do their thing. And we started something around the 65%. So the, the end result of that has been really 30 senior emerging leaders yearly uh, across all sorts of spectrums that has really, frankly, totally changed the dynamic at, at Jefferson. We have the lowest rate of physician burnout just about any academic medical center in the country. And interestingly, we just did the same survey. We're not at 20, 65, and 15 anymore. We're at 40, 45, and 15. We still have that 15%. But once you get to the point where the people that get it and the people in the middle are, are about the same, your culture changes. And they start to appreciate the entrepreneurial things you do. And we get them to remember why they went into healthcare to begin with. So I'm going to leave you with uh, some quotes from my two favorite uh, things, uh, basketball and science fiction. This is a quote from Pat Riley. When a great team loses through complacency, it will constantly search for new and more intricate explanations to explain away defeat. After a while, it becomes more innovative in thinking up why they lost than thinking up how to win. So at Jefferson, we've decided to stop making excuses about why we can't train medical students differently or do a healthcare system differently. And these are the things that we need to do. We really need to understand a very different way of selecting and educating medical students. Uh, we need to go uh, back to a Marcus Welby type thing with the analytics of house. Um, why do we have the same number of African-American males accepted into US medical school in the 2010s as we did in the 1970s? Um, if you go on the American Medical Student Association uh, website, they'll talk about the E-Road to Success, emergency medicine, radiology, anesthesiology, ophthalmology, and dermatology. But we talk about family doctors being the quarterback of the system. We need a revolution in how we look at hospitals and medical schools. It's not just based on NIH funding uh, and, 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 and the houses. It's what are they really doing as far as patient experience and access and innovation. That's not what rankings are today. Um, we need to recognize that uh, soon there will be health care with no address, just like telebanking. We should have access to care in your home. And what about a believable, understandable bill? Right? I mean, if you got a bill from Amazon like you get from most hospitals, you wouldn't pay it. And part of that is because you've lived in this world of other people's money and, and not questioning us. Um, and some of this is going to be you acting as consumers the way you do in every place else, which will force us to change and de demand, demand the same conven convenience you come to expect everywhere else. Um, and finally, uh, don't wait for somebody else to solve it. Uh, Washington will spend a lot of time looking at policy, but they're not going to solve the problem. It's going to be us. It's going to be you as patients demanding it. It's going to be millennials looking and saying, I expect the same kind of care that I get in, in other areas of my life. By the way, all of this is coming out of my new book in March 15th called Bless This Mess, a picture story of healthcare in America. Warning, this is not a children's story. Do not read at bedtime. It's scary. And then we have to have outcomes. This is, uh, this I go around the country and talk to medical staffs. This is a uh, quote from Jason Kidd. We're going to turn this team around 360 degrees. We do a lot of that in academics and medicine, a lot of effort, uh, but we end up at the same place. And then um, finally, on the, on, the, on the science fiction side, uh, one of my mentors, Yoda, I'll just let him uh, speak for himself. Because without getting dots to be more creative, they are doomed. You must make sure that the conference happens. Steve Clasco, an OBGYN doc from Philadelphia, will talk about creativity as a skill set, he will. That program will produce doctors who go home and defeat the dark side of non-creative healthcare. That group became the core group for an optimistic future. Learn what you can from the OBGYN doctor. And may the forceps be with you. Hmm? So, um, be happy to answer any questions. Um, if you have Slido, uh, feel free to just uh, text them, and we can put them up. And uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate you being here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, if you can, that'd be great. One of the things I've noticed a lot is how much time doctors spend charting, and I think it contributes to the um, issues with communication with patients. Is that something your hospital system has thought about? Because you're bringing a lot of creativity to other spaces, but you didn't talk about yeah. that piece. I'm so, curious. No, it's a great, great point. So 
and, and it's part of the issue, and it's part of why, why I'm so passionate. I, I do a lot of work with uh, Judy Faulkner, who's the CEO of Epic, which is the largest uh, EMR. The reason the EMRs are non-physician and patient friendly, and that they're so expensive, is because back in the 80s and 90s, when they said, hey, we have a good idea, let's make electronic medical records, doctors said, no, we don't have to do that. We're just going to keep writing things down, and the nurses will have to read it. So the, the EMR system in this country got done by computer folks with no help from docs. It wasn't their fault. Judy Faulkner is a good example. She was a computer science major back in time when no women were computer science major. She tried to get doctors to give $10,000 to start this EMR. By the way, the six that did are now worth over $2 billion because Judy is, Epic is, is one of them. So, the, so what we, we've, we've tried to overcome that. There, there's two things that have to happen. One is we have to have open source coding for EMRs. So what it means is turn your handwriting to PDF should not be a $300 million uh, thing that we send to Cerner or, or, or Epic. And then you should win based on an app store. In the meantime, what we're working on in Jefferson right now, we're, we have scribes, so they're doing a lot of the, uh, the, the, the work, but that's an inefficient sort of jury rig system. What we think will happen is that we'll move to, and we're working with Apple on this, move to a, a Siri type model, where Siri will be able to listen to my interaction with the patient, um, and then basically you know, transcribe it, so that then I can, when I'm writing my note, uh, you know, relive that. That that that's and and then we'll 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 digitize it and put it on so you can actually see 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 the. Con I mean, we're going to need that kind of technology because you're right. I used to sit next to a patient, an obstetric patient, looking in her eyes and maybe once in a while writing down a note, and I was right there and I was you know holding her hand if I needed to. Now um you know. Yes, yes, okay, so when was your last, you know, it, it's the exact opposite of what you want to do. So, so that's another area of understanding that the humans need to have that human touch, but using technology to help them do it. Hi, that was a great presentation. Thank you. I'm, uh, Stephanie Boltz from UCSF, and this is wonderful. I have a question. The pie chart you put up earlier about what most medical schools spend their time on, I'm assuming that you guys spend more time talking about health disparity and structural inequality with your medical students. Can you talk more about how you increased that um, or what yeah. new curricular? Yeah. So, 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 you know, look, I think everybody, uh, and, and UCSF has done some great work with this also, because um, I know some of the folks there, I think we're all tweaking the system. We just started a new curriculum, which I'll be happy to communicate with you, called Jeff MD Plus, which literally changes a lot of the way that we do the traditional first year. And the most important thing is it gives everybody across all four years some of those things like disparities and, 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 um, and quality. And every student has to take a minor. And that minor can be in disparities or global health or, what, or design. You know, so the whole Jeff design piece is, and, and, and those minors are such that you can literally maybe with another little bit get a master's in design. So we actually wrote an article for New England Journal of Medicine about our MD master's in design. We have a deal with Princeton University where we take 10 students to get admitted after their first year. They go through all of Princeton, but we tell them they don't have to take the MedCats, take the minimum amount of, of, of courses that you need to take to get into medical school, and they get an MD master's in design. So I think there are, so, so it's both curricular and selection, but I'd be happy to share that with you and, and, and get your email address. Very much. So I am um, related to your talk in two ways. One, I'm a director of biochemistry at a liberal, liberal arts college, and second, I'm the wife of a burnt out uh, pulmonary critical care physician. So I saw both sides of this equation. Um, when I teach developmental genetics, I strive right now to um, redesign the course so that students are rewarded for creativity and not graded on facts. Um, but the challenge is, is that these pre-med students, I teach basically all of them in our college, are told or advised that they have to get the A's, right? They have to get the grades, they have to study <coughs> for the MCATs. And so for those of us who are trying to do more innovative, creative work with our students, how do we translate this new trend down, trickle it down to the college students? Yeah, it, it, so thank you, it's a great question. And, and you know, I mean, it's one of the, things that we haven't solved yet. The AAMC, the American Association of Medical College, is still stuck in the, in the 80s. I mean, if you think about this, take those students. 
they've gotten to that half of 1% of, of, of being able to memorize stuff and do our grade on organic chemistry and pass you know, multiple choice tests. And then they go through the first two years, which is really biology and biochemistry and anatomy, and they have to pass all these self-shelf exams. And now they're going to start the third year where they're talking to humans. In any other planet, that next test between the second and third year would be, can you talk to a human without foaming at the mouth? But what do we do as the gateway from second to third year? Give them another multiple choice test around biology and, 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 and chemistry. I mean, 95% of the people pass it. But think about what that tells people. You're about to actually interact with patients, and, and that's all that matters. So that's something that I can't solve, although you know, we talk about that. I just wrote an editorial for WMC. What I think is happening, and what I would suggest to you in your university, is that you start to look at the consortium of schools that are using holistic criteria. And it's expanding. It's expanding. Mount Sinai in New York. Us, I mean, there's, there's actually a, a, a coalition that was set up by the Marcus Foundation, Bernie Marcus, um, and a guy named Fred Sanfilippo, I can get you his address, of 30 schools that the AMA views as folks that are doing that. And then you can get those, those, those folks into, uh, in, in, into that. There's a question here, how do you measure empathy? It's a great question. Um, and it would take too long to talk about the measures we use, but whoever asked that, I actually have an article that we just wrote on that so that I'll be happy to uh, actually have it printed out here. So I'll actually uh, give it to you. So this is somewhat related to the previous question. Um, when I was a grad student at MIT, I, I would be, you know, a, a teaching assistant for, for undergrads. And this one kid, all he ever wanted to do was be a psychiatrist. And I remember he was, he, he said to me, all I've ever wanted to do is talk to people, be a psychiatrist, and here I'm, I'm memorizing the deals, all their condensation reaction, organic chemistry, like, talk about a disconnect. Um, so, I know you don't have a lot of leeway because of the, you know, AAMC and so forth, but, but do, do you see a future in which this sort of canonized series of prereqs, the two semesters of orgo, the two semesters of physics and so forth, what's it, what's it gonna take to, do you, do, you, do, you, do you think that a student can be prepared with, without going yeah. through all those? And what do you think is sort of like the minimum that undergrad students should be, should be learning to, to so, then go on to med school? So, so I'm over time, I'm gonna answer this briefly, yeah, but, sure. but, but I, I can give you a, a, a much, uh, much bigger. I think if I was ruling the world, and I think where we'll get to, is we'll actually have different tracks. Um, that if, you, you know, if you're gonna be a psychiatrist or a family doc, again, minimum amount of science knowledge, but we're gonna choose you based on this. And frankly, we, you know, we're gonna actually have some of the things to, to pass from here to here based on more around behavioral clinical skills and that kind of thing. If you're gonna be a physician scientist, it should be exactly the way we do it now. If you're gonna be, uh, by the way, if you're gonna be an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon, we might want to check your technical skills. Because again, what's asinine about medical education today is that I, Steve Clasco, the medical student, can decide I want to be a neurosurgeon or an orthopedist based on not any, any assessment of my technical skills. And by the way, the only way anybody could assess my technical skills is whether or not I can hold a retractor very well. Then they get into an orthopedic or neurosurgery residency and they fail because they don't have the technical skills. So I tell our neurosurgery and orthopedic folks, Look, you should put them on a simulator, get one of those little games, you know, while they're waiting in the waiting room and see how they do on that. So I think, I think we'll end up tracking it. I, I got to end, but, but, but I'll, stay, I'll stay for anybody that wants to talk. Yeah. No, no, but, but, but I'll, I'll, come and, I'll come and talk to you. Thanks. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.